westerly, there was like what cannon at the armory, which exploded and killed one of the soldiers. The battle death that they saw was in Westerly. <laughs> um, when they enlisted for 90 days, Governor Sprague wanted to be the colonel of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, so he had the legislature pass law that a private received from the federal government $12 a month in pay. And Rhode Island was going to pay them $13 a month extra. So they enlisted. When the 90 days were up, the Rhode Island legislature changed it and only made it $15 a year instead of the extra per month. Connecticut, which was a wealthy state, and Governor Buckingham was very much a pro-union governor, had an incentive of $12 federal pay, $13 a month for privates, extra from Connecticut, plus $30 a year. So 70 men from Westerly crossed the river and enlisted in Mystic. And ironically, I, I represent, I'm a private in the 8th Connecticut, uh, the 8th Regiment Connecticut Volunteers. Ironically, they were mustered into Company G of the 8th Connecticut. So it, it's kind of a, a fun thing. Just to go over what I'm wearing. The hat I'm wearing is er pretty much everything you see here is wool. Uh, <laughs> the hat is a McDowell forage cap. This is called a sack coat. There were two types of coats worn by soldiers uh, in the infantry, either a sack coat or a frock coat. A frock coat has a higher collar, 13 buttons on the front, buttons here, it's more, and tails. It's more of a formal one. Um, a lot of times when units were first uh, mustered in, they wore a frock coat. Um, the pants I'm wearing are sky blue, they're wool. Underneath the pants are my socks and my drawers, which these aren't wool, they're, co they're, they're muslin. And then my boots that I'm wearing, they're called brogans. They're made out of pig skin, but the um, sole is leather. This is my canteen. There were two types of canteens that federal soldiers wore. Smooth side, which is like this one, or um, later in the war, they made them look like a bullseye almost, and the thought was that it would be stronger. They weren't. The canteen itself is tin, and then inside it's coated with beeswax so that it doesn't rust. This is my haversack. It's uh, canvas that's painted to keep it waterproof. This is where a soldier would keep all of his food, his rations, things like that. The tin cup here is my coffee cup, it's my drinking cup, it's what I boil things in. The main thing soldiers boiled, coffee. No matter where they stopped, they would immediately start to boil coffee. When you're carrying things, weight is important. In the beginning of the war, they would carry a, a frying pan, along with a plate, which when you add it all together, starts weighing a lot. So some of them went to a lighter frying pan, but you still have a handle. Eventually, most of the soldiers went to this which is just half a canteen. When a canteen became unserviceable, they would throw it in the fire, break the solder, and have a canteen half. And I do it right, there we go. 
you can cook right over the fire with it. So for these are original, uh, they're bone handles. Another type that they carry for wooden handle. And you can, after you can more than welcome to come up here. And then this is a government issue spoon. Only the US government would come up with a spoon like this. Instead of just being one piece, it's a spoon, and then it's riveted to the handle, which invariably rusts and breaks off. <laughs> Only the government would do that. <laughs> My rifle is an 1857 Springfield. It weighs about 10 pounds. It's very heavy. It fires a, what's called a mini ball. I've got two paths around their lead so they're in plastic. And you can see what it looks like. It's got striations on it because it's actually a rifle. It's not a musket. of being blind. The bayonet is about 18 inches long. It wasn't used very much in war. Um, the idea of killing somebody that close and personal that looks like you, speaks like you, has the same history as you, it just wasn't used very much. One purpose that was used a lot for the bayonet was as a candle holder. <laughs> it sticks into the ground, and it's perfect for that. The way you load the rifle, it's a very prescribed step. First you turn it and put it away from your face so that you don't have powder going off. This one right here, this, this piece of uh, leather is called my cartridge box. This is my cap box. So he would reach in, grab a cartridge. If this was a real cartridge, the bottom half would be the round, top half is the, the powder. You bite it off, pour the powder down the barrel, and then seat the round. Once you have that, draw the rammer, ram the round nut down, I'll pass some of these around as well. You'd put the, the cap on here, and then you'd fire it. What happens is, the powder's down the bottom of the barrel. When the cap is hit, it causes a, a little spark to go through a channel right here, and it ignites the powder. The rounds that you saw, the mini ball rounds, if you notice, there's striations on them. What that does is, there's one, there's one rifling in this barrel. It's not a lot of rifling. If a modern rifle, if you look down the barrel, it's, it's like a spiral in there, but there's one. And that mini ball, the bottom, it's a little bit of hollow. The heat from the powder igniting causes the lead to swell up just a little bit, and it, would, it takes the rifling. It's accurate to about 400 yards. So it's actually pretty accurate. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately for the soldiers, they were still using Napoleonic te techniques, which didn't um, I'll pass that around so you can see that what it looks like. It looks like a little top, top hat. The Napoleonic techniques and, and strategy they were using were back when it was still muskets. So close formations, uh, close firing. So it, it didn't help the, uh, the poor guys. I always say that for the soldiers of the Civil War, they had the two combinations that were the worst in history. They had the advent of modern weaponry and still at the time, medieval medicine. So, so 
Mark, how many shots? A good rifleman can get about two shots a minute off. The way that they fired is when you are in a battle line, they won't, wouldn't all fire at once because I'll, then you're done and everybody's, you know. So uh, when they fought, they fought in two ranks. So you might have the rear rank fire and then as they're loading, the front rank would fire. Another one is they would fire by file. And what I mean by that is you start at the right side of the company line, the front, the two guys front and back fire, and boom, 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 boom down the line to keep up a continuous fire. So, but about two shots a minute. Um, a really, really good rifleman can get off three. Um, even though it's wood, it does get hot. I've been in um, instances where you're firing round after round after round and you can barely hold the, uh, the rifle. So, it's, like I said, it's heavy. If you want to come up here, I'll show you how they fired. So you would be the front rank gentleman, so face the crowd and move up just a little bit so I can be the rear rank. And the way that they fired for the rear rank is just like this. So. <laughs> it, it, it's it's a little loud, but it's you don't feel any blast or anything else like that. So wow! So they were all deaf after that. What? <laughs> <laughs> now for marching, when they fought, they fought in a long, long battle line. Uh, my regiment had initially a thousand men. Uh, as the war progressed, from disease and other things the regiment numbers went down. If you ever go to Gettysburg, for instance, there are left and right markers for each regiment that were put in uh, by a um, historian who spent most of his life talking to, vet to veterans and they came down to actually ask where they were. And you can see that the lines are really small. Um, by 1863, a regiment that was mustered in 61 probably was down to 200 men. Um, it was seven to one disease versus battle death. So, which was, which was actually pretty good. The, uh, you look at the Mexican War or 1812, it was 13 to one. So it's actually a lot better. But anyway, they fought in these long, long lines. Now, if you're marching, it's kind of hard to find a road that can, is that wide. So they marched in a column of fours. If I can ask you three to come up here. So, oh, there's the other one. So, so, if you could have two of you, one here and one here facing that way. This way? Yep, so. Oh, I should turn. And then me, oh, you right me. there. And then come back here with me. Okay. Nope, you stay there. Okay. So now, <laughs> you're marching in a column of fours. So this is the width. Actually, it'd be four people, but it'd be the width. And then when they need to fight, what happens is you just turn. And now the whole column that was marching. Oh, we're all facing, we're all facing the same yep. direction. Got it. So, but that's. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Actually, rear rank's better. But, <laughs> but that's the way that they would uh, be able to march and fight as opposed to having to try to find mm -hmm. an area. Um, there wasn't much use of camouflage or anything else like that. You, you weren't blue, first of all. Second, um, if, if you got a thousand or fifty thousand men marching, it kicks up a tremendous amount of dust. But uh, we've done marches for different organizations and things like that where there's a lot of us and if you're in the back of the line, you, you can barely breathe. So, speaking of marches, I didn't talk about this. This is a hardy hat. It was worn by um, some Pennsylvania units and a lot of Michigan units. If you wear this in the summer, it is basically a solar oven. But a few years back, we uh, marched in real time down at Gettysburg, starting um, when we did it for the 153rd Pennsylvania. We started early in the morning, way south of the battlefield, 
and marched at the exact same time that they were marching on July 1st, 1863, through the entire thing. Went, uh, we got to go in areas that the public doesn't get across, like where Pickett's Charge took place two days later. Uh, but it was, it was a really neat thing. But the 153rd Pennsylvania had these, and that's where the, uh, the red, in 1862, they started to be able to identify units they had for uh, the core badge, depending on the battalion they're in, either red, white, or blue. That's, and that's why that's got a red patch on it. So. The hat you're wearing, it's very tall, right? You took it off your life back in before you. What, was that double for had other purpose? No, it's just. With the, like a bucket? Yeah. We, we actually we use it sometimes for ice so, <laughs> and coffee. Uh, if, if there's a coffee ration, we'll just put it in there before we uh, bring it back. So, In the winter, soldiers would wear a gray coat. Why is it gray, you might ask? I thought the rebels wore gray and the Union wore blue. Prior to the war, there was no this side will wear blue, this side will wear gray. The 8th Connecticut, we always thought they had gray freight coats, and we weren't 100% sure. In the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, there's a collection of watercolors from a private Shadrach who um, was in the 8th Connecticut, and he uh, painted watercolors. And when we went down there, and there was a picture of them coming acro uh, across the uh, field in Newborn, uh, Newborn, North Carolina, and they're wearing it. And it's gray, so it's. If you look at pretty much every single Civil War monument in New England, they're always wearing their gray coat. If you notice that, almost always, the soldiers didn't wear them that often, because you can feel this. It's heavy, okay, <laughs> and as once again, if you want to carry something, do you really want to carry this? So a lot of times they just threw them to the side of the road, which seems a shame. But, but I'll leave this here. Anyone's welcome to uh, carry it later on. This is the pack that we carry. Um, my unit is very, very uh, much carry in what you're going to and carry out, so that you don't have to. So we. We'll talk later. <laughs> so we carry our pack, haversacks, and that's it. The pack itself, just like the haversack, is painted canvas. It's got two compartments. One of the blankets that a person, a soldier, carried. Is a rubber blanket. It's vulcanized rubber on one side canvas on the other and it also serves as a poncho mm -hmm. so it's got multiple purposes the biggest thing we use it for is as a ground cloth when you're sleeping I've been doing this a long time between this and the US Army I figure I've spent about a year of my life sleeping on the ground so, <laughs> Pass these around. This is another pair of drawers, so you can see how thick. Because I don't think anyone wants to feel my own pants, but you can see how thick the uh, the wool is for the pants. <laughs> Hair shirt. <laughs> Wear that in July. But uh, some of the things that you hear about uh, Civil War. Um, terms that came about. You've all heard the term shoddy, which in this town you may know what it means, but uh, a lot of times the, the term of it is like poor workmanship. When the war started, there wasn't a lot of wool sitting around. And shoddy was a type of material made from wool fibers where they were glued together, almost like a flannel kind of idea. Unfortunately, for a lot of the soldiers, mark makers that weren't 100% honest 
used water-based glue. You can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> so the shoddy just basically melted off of these poor, poor guys. So that's where the term shoddy comes from, that, as far as that. For tentage, that's what made me think of this. When they first started, they had um, either Sibley tents, which look like a giant Indian teepee. They sleep about 20 guys. They have a wood stove in the middle. They're beautiful tents, comfortable to sleep in, but they're enormous. And they're very heavy, and baggage trains cause, you need mules, you need trains, you can't move as quickly. They then moved to something called an A-frame tent, which looks like a giant A but you can stand up in it. It can sleep up to six men inside of it. But once again, you've got these big, big tent poles, big pieces of canvas. So the army came up with the idea of giving each man a half. You can see this is two halves buttoned together, a shelter half. And they formed these tents that they could carry on their back. So, makes sense. Soldiers hated them because they only stand about lay at all. To get in, you have to crawl in and out on your hands and knees. They, they said they weren't fit for a dog, and they would call them their dog tents. How many people have heard the term pup tent? That's where it came from. Another one is a general in, from, from Rhode Island, actually, Ambrose Burnside. If you've ever seen pictures of Ambrose Burnside, he had these giant mutton whiskers that came down on the side. The men liked Burnside as a commander, and they turned his name backwards and called them Sideburn. sideburns. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, a lot of terms came down from that. It was the first time yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's back up here. <laughs> it was the first time in the nation's history where we had this many people come together. Things like baseball started. Of course, the poor farm boys also had measles and everything else that the city people were pretty much already used to. So like it said, seven to one, battlefield death versus sickness. Let's talk about food and what we're cooking in any of these things over here. The basic diet for a soldier was either salt beef or salt pork. Uh, you, no refrigeration, so you need something. And I think I might have one in here. Yeah, this thing. Hardtack. <laughs> and it is hard. You can, this one's about two years old. It doesn't go bad. <laughs> Heart attack. <laughs> you can gnaw on the corners, and uh, it's not bad. But <laughs> and they, uh, that was their basic diet. Now, your mother always told you, you need to eat your vegetables. If there weren't fresh vegetables around, some of the thing, one of the things that started happening was scurvy. So the government came up with something called desiccated vegetables, where they would take a lot of greens, uh, leaves, things like that. They would boil them down and then press them with two, sc two screens into a flat piece of about yay big of vegetables. And then the idea was for the soldiers to boil them and be able to um, get some vitamin C that way. They hated them. They called them desecrated vegetables. So one of the things that followed the army everywhere were sellers of goods. They were called sutlers. And they would, soldiers would be able to get pies, cookies, cakes, vegetables, fresh fruits, and things like that from sutlers. So that was um, one of the uh, things. But salt pork, salt beef, hard tech. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> It is. <laughs> so would you put that in water or something, or would you just? Yeah. Um, the, one of the, yeah. One of the things that they did a lot of. It, obviously, if you're uh, you're marching, you can gnaw on it, but you'll break it up with usually with this. Okay, and uh, break it apart and 
they would take it, I'll show you have the, just the powder of it, and put it inside the grease in their frying pan and make a little pancake out of it. And that was one of the things that they did. If they were in a camp situation, like a winter camp, anything like that, a lot of times the army would have bakeries. Uh, going so they got fresh bread. So uh, the hard tack was more in during a campaign season. But if they were in, like I said, a s solitary place, they'd get fresh bread. Baked by um, army cooks though, so sometimes it was toast, sometimes it was dough. <laughs> Let's talk about medical care and things. Like I said, seven to one for battlefield deaths versus um, to death from disease. The precursor of the Red Cross was something called the United States Sanitary Commission. It was private. Um, a lot of generals didn't like the Sanitary Commission coming in, but they came in. They were able to set up um, latrines and, or sinks, as they were called back then, away from the camp so that it was a little bit more sanitary. They were able to get um, fresh vegetables for the soldiers, things like that. But disease still ran rampant. If you were unlucky enough to be hit in battle, there's a couple of things. If you were hit in your trunk, it basically was a mortal wound. There was no, no understanding of sepsis or uh, bacteria or anything like that. So the, the, the surgery at the time just didn't, didn't even exist to be able to do that. If you were hit in an extremity, you saw the size of those rounds. They're pretty big. And because it's soft lead, when it hits, it doesn't just go as a round, it splats. And it caused, generally, if you were hit in an arm or a leg, the bone was shattered. And the surgery at the time just didn't exist to repair that. So it was amputation. Um, it, arms and legs were piled outside for surgery. What they would do is usually either a barn or if there were houses nearby, they would take the doors off from the inside of the house and use those for the surgical tables. There was some anesthesia, not a lot. So a lot of times it was just done. Um, if you're going to have an amputation, they were pretty good about that at, at the time. They would cut the skin below where they were going to amputate, pull it back, saw the bones, that's where you, the term saw bones comes from do, for doctors, or like McCoy on Star Trek. <laughs> Once they had the, uh, the bone cut, they would take the skin and layer it and sew it back together and then put bandages over it. And that's one of the things the Sanitary Commission was very good about is getting as many bandages as they could. Uh, the home front, a lot of women would also keep the uh, lint. They would scrape cloth and make lint to be able to pack uh, things in there. Now, you've been sewn up. You're, you're going to get an infection. It's a guarantee because in the conditions you're in, plus the idea that they just sawed this person, now they're sawing on this one. There were two types of infections, white pus, yellow pus. I know it's a lovely subject. Yellow pus was no good. White was better. And then one of the ways that they cleaned out the wounds was maggots. In an army camp, there's tons of maggots around, and they would put those in there, and they would actually clean the wound. But for generally, for people that were wounded, it was a long, long recovery. There are a lot of cases where people were shot in the trunk, and they ended up recovering, but it's not um, as likely. One of the um, gentlemen that I know, his great-great-grandfather, Oliver Dart, was shot right here. and. There's pictures. Uh, the army didn't give you a pension when you got it. Even if you were wounded, you had to apply. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> the government has always been the government. Okay. And uh, we have pictures of Oliver Dart without a beard, 
and it's just like horrifically bad disfiguring. He grew he grew a, a giant bushy beard, which he kept over it, but um, he couldn't. Uh, he lost the, most of his upper jaw from that shot, but he survived, lived until old age. So, just luck of the draw for some people were better than others. Let's see what else I have. Bear with me for a minute. Once again, I need to look at my list. Another part of sanitation was, like I said, drinking water and disease. You have, like for instance, the Army of the Potomac, when they were in winter camp, you have 110, 120,000 soldiers all trying to find water. Rivers were there, but while you're getting water from the river over here, Someone is down here using the river for a whole nother purpose. Okay. <laughs> so it was that. The other issue that they had when they were in winter camp for a long time was firewood. If you look at pictures that were taken from that time period, you'll notice there are no trees. A, a, um, just a, a Civil War company of anywhere from 20 to 100 men, depending on the size of the company, would use over an acre of trees every, every year just for, for firewood. They didn't build giant fires, but you still need wood to cook. You need cooked wood to keep warm, just for light. And it, they went farther and farther out. And if you look at the pictures from the time, you can see there's not a tree in sight. It's an amazing thing. So. This right here is called a housewife. And it's my sewing kit. <laughs> Every soldier would carry one. One of the things that soldiers delighted in was getting the picture taken. There were all types of different photographies at the time. There were uh, prints that were made on paper. There were amber types, which is a glass plate negative that is actually very, just a ghostly gray image on it, and, but there's a piece of black glass behind it. This one right here is of me a few years back, a number of years back, uh, but it's taken. And the image, because it's on a glass plate the way it is, the image is actually reversed. So, but you can see what it looks like. And that, this, this one's called an amber type. Another type is it's a piece of tin, and the image is printed on the tin. Both of these pictures were taken with period cameras, and with this one, when the photographer was developing it, he's dipping it in this thing, and I said, what is that? And he's like, oh, it's cyanide. So, uh, <laughs> And for all the pictures, you have to hold still for the count of six or eight, depending on the camera. So if you notice, when you look at period pictures, uh, they're not smiling because it's almost impossible to hold a smile that long. For, also, they didn't have a lot of teeth. So they didn't want to show that. For women, if you look at the pictures at the time for women, they look old. It's not that they were necessarily old. The camera favors the blue wavelength of light and it's just not favorable for, for a woman. So that's why they look kind of drawn like that where the men don't have that same look. It's kind of a different thing. So, but soldiers did that. The box that I have here is what army bread or uh, the hardtack would have come in. Boxes were prized, they didn't burn those. Uh, they make nice seats, they make something you can carry. So th those, th th some of them still have survived and that this one's based on one of those. Questions? 
Yes. So you had mentioned that seven to one uh, battle injuries versus disease. When they came home, were they still treated the same? Were they still considered killed in battle or killed? There's killed there's mortally mortally wounded, and then um, killed in action. With the weaponry of the time, like the cannons, for instance, um, I didn't talk about this, but cannons fired several different rounds. They fired solid shot, which is what you would think it is, just a giant cannonball. They fired case shot, which looks like a cannonball, but it's fired in the air and has a fuse and explodes and rains pieces of shrapnel down. And then there's something called grape shot, which the cartridge itself looks like a, a coffee can. It's probably the best thing you can think of. And inside it's filled with tiny metal balls, hundreds of them. And it turns the cannon into a giant shotgun, basically. It would blow enormous holes in a battle line. But if you were unfortunate enough to be that close to a cannon firing uh, grape shot, it was the very first war where there was nothing left to actually be recovered. The bodies would just ev evaporate from that. But the, um, mortally wounded, killed in action. And then um, if they were sent home and they died, they were still counted as a battle death. Even if it was from disease? Or Not from disease. Disease, you were, you were unlucky enough to be that way. But for a, a wound. He still did. And there are cases of people dying years and years later because the round lodged near their spine or, and it wasn't taken out. So it, it could, and then all of a sudden it moved and caused a blood clot. So it was, they were very unfortunate for that. Yes? Initially I thought you said there were seven deaths from disease versus one battle. Yes. Right, is that right? Yes. Seven deaths from disease versus yes. one battle. Okay. Yep. Okay. The number one cause of death in the Civil War was diarrhea. So, not a very uh, glamorous way to go, but it was, you would become dehydrated and, and die from it. It was the number one cause. And it was, it's pretty much every war prior to the Civil War, it was the same thing, uh, just because of the lack of sanitation. Yes? My great-great-grandfather was Thomas Nelson Chapman, lived on Pierce Street area, and he was part of the, the Westerly Rifles. He did the three-month enlistment. Uh, we were fortunate enough to live in Southern Maryland, so I was able to get to the National Archives and able to get his entire uh, service record. His time in the service. But he did the three months, came back, yep. and then signed up for the duration, uh, left his wife with six children wow. and one pregnant Oof. to go off to finish the war. And the one that was born, the middle name was Burnside. <laughs> yeah. I found that kind of strange until I found out more about the Civil yeah. War. The 4th Rhode Island was part of uh, Harlan's Brigade and uh, it was part of the 9th, 9th Corps and the 9th Corps was commanded by General Burnside. Rhode Island didn't have that many full infantry regiments. What Rhode Island was known for was its artillery units. Uh, the, bat the artillery batteries didn't take as many men so being a smaller state. He was in one of those light artillery. Yep. So they, he did the, uh, all through the war, but he ended up in the Battle of Cedar Creek in yep. Southern Virginia. And yep. uh, Jubal Early, the Confederate general, he surprised uh, the Union by coming in in the morning with the fog in the mountains and totally routed, routed them. So as my uh, great grandfather's running for great great he's running for his life. He gets hit with one of those mini balls in his right arm, which severs the nerve, destroys the bone. So now we we're left with one of these. He eventually went to Philadelphia and then was discharged and the like. But getting the pension to say that you're fully disabled, the testimonials you've had to have of people said, was he really there? Did he really get, no, this arm, this <laughs> this arm like this. It was into the 1890s. It, it's crazy, got, isn't it? Fully, fully disabled. Yep. That was on top of chronic diarrhea. 
we had it out because they were under the stars a lot. Yep. Uh, I don't know how, how they did that. The I, last thing is that in, in the town hall there are some great records of, of town meetings of we got to help the families because they simply left their families. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, my great great mother, grandmother must have been something. <laughs> seven kids, you know, like, and they ended up having three, three, four more. Wow. But yeah. uh, you know, they, what the town did have to support uh, this effort. Yeah. So. I've been at, I've done several, well, God, I don't know how many reenactments at Cedar Creek, and the ground is just undulating uh, waves, and when you're there, because of the way the ground is, you're waiting, you don't see anything, and all of a sudden you see a battle flag, and then like demons coming out of the earth. You see the rebels coming at you because they almost rise out of the ground the way the, the ground is. Um, Jubal Early did surprise the Union. But uh, Phil Sheridan came back, he was in Winchester coming back from a meeting, rallied the Union troops, and by the afternoon they were back in their camps. One of the things that stalled the rebel advances, they got to the Union camps and they started looting the tents for food, clothing, everything else, and it sort of broke apart. Jubal Early couldn't do it. And then Sheridan rallied them and drew, um, they actually pushed Early back farther than he, where he was in the morning. But, but uh, Cedar Creek is, it's, like I said, the ground is just amazing. Talking about flags, um, you didn't have radio communications. You had telegraph, but you're not gonna bring a telegraph when you're moving. So each unit had two flags. You have, if you go to Rhode Island, you can see pictures in the State House. Um, in Connecticut, they're actually in the Hall of Flags. When you enter the State House, uh, there were several in pretty much every state house around that was a state at the time and they're they're very large they're silk the beautiful beautiful flags and you had your national flag which looks sort of like the u.s flag except where the blue field is instead of stars it's generally the state um, crest and then you had your regimental flag which would be your regimental um, done the connecticut units uh, it's the connecticut state seal rhode island uh, it, it looks sort of like the Rhode Island flag with the cross like this. They're all different ones. They were presented to the units as they left. Uh, Tiffany's made a lot of them, believe it or not. But a lot of them were sewn locally as well, but they're silk. And when you are marching and there's a great breeze, it's an amazing thing. But they're large. And that would allow a general to look in his uh, binoculars and see, oh, that's the first Rhode Island, that's the fourth Rhode Island, that's the you know, 153rd PA. He can see which units were there, and that was a way for them to be able to control the, uh, the battle. But the flags were considered the prize of the regiment, and to have one captured was a huge, huge um, shame. We did a reenactment at Gettysburg uh, on the 150th anniversary down there and we were, a couple, Gettysburg doesn't allow none of the, uh, very few of the national parks allow you to fire or do a reenactment on the park site itself. Uh, a few miles west of Gettysburg there's a field that looks very similar and um, the Pennsylvania units built a rock wall just like exists at the angle at the Gettysburg Park and we were representing the 14th Connecticut and there was a person from the 14th who jumped the rock wall and took the battle flag from the 14th Tennessee and he became a Medal of Honor winner. We had his great great I don't know how many grandsons back in with us and there was a we found a 14th Tennessee reenactment unit and they agreed to charge right at the angle and allow him to jump over the wall and grab their flag. And after it was all over and they came back to get it, they were like, even the, the Tennessee boys were like, that was just so amazing to be able to recreate something like that. And um, it, it was kind of a neat moment. And for that, because we were at the angle firing, we were firing in a rank of four and you would fire, go to the back of the line, next person, and, and so on. And we probably fired, I don't know, 50 or 60 rounds, and that was one of the times where this thing was so hot you could barely touch it. 
of course it was also 100 degrees but uh, that didn't help <laughs> we were walking back to where the cars were a couple miles away and the tar was melting on the road it was so hot but that's another day <laughs> A lot of units had a chaplain. Um, the Irish Brigade had I can't Father Corby, I think. He, there's a statue of him in um, at Notre Dame. But a lot of units had chapels. The be in the winter of 1863, a revival um, went through both armies, actually the Union and the Confederate armies, where camp meetings, revivals, everything else like that. Um, there were very most of it was a Protestant religion, but th it was. There were also people who uh, didn't care for that at all. But there was the U.S. Christian Commission, which was sort of like uh, that. The, they would hand out religious tracts, try to keep soldiers from straying, things like that. Uh, they had it's it's very very very. Um, hokey stories about the poor boy that went from his mother and different things but the, if you ever get a chance look up the U.S. Christian Commission online you can see some of the religious tracts that they passed out they're kind of fun to look at but yes there was um, religion and like I said revivals there were some chaplains not a lot in a battle the chaplains would serve as orderlies um, helping people off the the field and such but uh, they, every regiment did have surgeons, though. And you hear stories that the surgeons just drank the rum and stuff like that. Um, these guys worked under horrific conditions, just hour, 24, 36 hours without sleep, just operating on as many casualties as they could. And a lot of times, if the unit wasn't able, the army wasn't able to hold that ground, they stayed back with these people and became captured. If you were captured early in the war, you would be what's called paroled, where you signed a parole saying that you would not take up arms for a certain period of time. Beginning in 1864, when there were a lot more uh, colored troops in the US Army, the Confederates would not um, parole. They, they wouldn't um, treat the, the colored troops as s soldiers or as prisoners of war. They put them back into slavery and put them in um, work, and made them work on the uh, rebel works and things like that. So the U.S. Army stopped paroling. Um, that's where you have um, the atrocity of Andersonville in Georgia, which this prison was designed for maybe a thousand people, ended up with 15,000 people inside. If you've ever been to Andersonville, it's not a very large area, and to have that many people packed in there was just horrific conditions. But as cruel as it was, it probably ended the war sooner because the Union had a tremendous advantage in manpower where the Confederates didn't have it, and the Confederate Army just basically withered away. Uh, you take into it, that into account along with Sherman's march through Georgia and then up the Carolinas, you had more and more Union troops that were deserting to go home because their wife with six kids was left basically with no food, nothing. And so they came home, they would desert and leave as well, which also hastened the end of the war. But. Did that answer your question, Tom? All right. I saw a question over here. Well, I just oh. wanted to mention some things never changed because we had the, the shelter half was still part of our gear when I got Oh, yeah. Mine, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one, the, the new ones have ends. Uh, these don't have any ends on them. So, um, and they're very, it's only 54 inches wide. So when you're sleeping in it, and I do, and it rains, you basically have to curl up in a ball in the middle to stay dry. My wife over here, she all says we're all insane. Uh, <laughs> but I started doing this. I was a, I majored in history in the in college, and one of the things I always ask my professors is, what was it like for the average soldier? You read about battles and the thirty thousand foot view, but you don't really read what it was like. There was a couple of books, Johnny Reb and Billy Yank, that were written in the 50s by a guy named Wiley. But other than that, there wasn't much research and much done on it. There's a lot more now. 
but I saw I was working uh, in East Hartford and Pratt & Whitney Aircraft back then had a little newspaper and there was a little ad that somebody was forming a unit and that's where I started and you really can't experience the life of a soldier or understand it until you wear this stuff in July in Pennsylvania or Virginia and uh, you realize how hot, hot it is and when you're in a battle line and you're firing and you see somebody across the way take a bead right at you and fire and you realize damn I would have been either wounded or dead at this moment if I was a soldier. So um, if we do it, like I said, the history markers and things like that to honor these guys and um, keep the history alive for people, but also to see as much as it was, as much as we can, you know, we're not going to get uh, consumption or hopefully not um, some other disease, but as much as we can to see what their life was like. And uh, it's always been something that I've enjoyed because I've done it for a long time. <laughs> yes? What were the number of deaths in the union, on the Union side versus the... The conventional number, and some research has said it's probably higher, was 360,000 Union death and 260,000 Confederate death for about 620,000. Some more research done puts that number closer to 700,000. Now, when you consider the nation was 33 million at the time, it's a tremendous amount of loss. No one ever expected it to be like that. And it, it, it just, it, four years of uh, warfare just dragged on, and especially in the Eastern Theater. I mean, the battles were just massive. We've done, um, uh, at Spotsylvania, Virginia, we've done uh, work with the National Park Service down there. They, at the, the, there was a mule shoe. It was an angle that the Confederate works had where the Union kept on trying to storm it. And unfortunately, by this point in the war, people behind any kind of defense able to fire and um, the attacking troops basically had no no chance. What they did was uh, con General Emery, Emery Elkton actually made the guys go into battle with the rifles unloaded because that way they, they would continue to charge until they hit the parapet because what would happen is if they were loaded they'd fire and then drop down to the ground and uh, in advance would stall. So they started making them go in without the rifles loaded. So. About 10 miles south of where my wife and I lived was uh, Point Lookout. It was the Union's version of Andersonville. So the area would be like a spit of land. You have the Potomac River on one side uh, and the Chesapeake Bay on the other. So it's wet. So this is where they were. There's, there's a big discussion going on as to how many people actually, how many soldiers actually died there, uh, Confederate soldiers. And the thing is, we're saying how many. They're saying that more than likely it's four to five times the number that were recorded actually died in that place. Mm -hmm. as, as bad as it was. Yeah. As, it was horrid. At least Andersonville, which I've been to, that was, you, you could at least find some dry land. You were not going to find that in that area there. Yeah. There's a storm because you're at sea level. Yeah. Yeah, they were kept there. Uh, Fort Warren in Boston Harbor was another area where prisoners were kept, uh, for Confederate prisoners were kept. Um, they were, the Union prisoners were kept also uh, outside of Richmond on a spit of land called Libby Island, which we, when we were there, we actually crossed underneath the underneath I-95 that goes through Richmond. There's a, a pedestrian bridge underneath it. You can't see it from the highway. And we crossed over to Libby Island, and there wasn't a single marker, nothing whatsoever, that designated that this was a uh, prisoner of war camp for Union soldiers. When we got back to the other side where the Trafalgar Iron Works were, there was a small little picture that showed, it was from the period, showed Libby Island. As it, was, as it was then, but there was nothing on the island itself, which was kind of a shame, so. Well, you are in Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> so.
Cedar Creek, by the way, is, is in private hands. It's not a national park. Uh, the, it, it's not used to be the American Civil War um, Battlefield Trust. Now it's just the uh, Battlefield um, uh, Trust that uh, preserves private land as much as they can. Right above Cedar Creek, Bear um, Pharmaceuticals built, was building this giant uh, factory and they wanted to continue to encroach on the battlefield and um, it was purchased to keep it in perpetuity as a bet in the battlefield. Reading through his records, it's amazing to me how how little fighting they did versus the time that they were in. It, you had tremendous amounts of time, downtime, where you would drill, where you practice, you, things like that, and then these short bursts of horrific fighting until really the last year of the war. From May of 1864 until April of 1865, it was continuous fighting in the Eastern Theater at least. But yeah, up until then, you would have these short bursts and then downtime and then another horrific short burst. There wasn't a lot of thought that, that people, that they um, experienced PTSD, what we call PTSD. <coughs> but if you read the lives of these people, they didn't just go back and become farmers or factory workers again. A lot of these guys suffered from um, alcoholism and different fits and everything else because they did have it. Um, it just wasn't recognized at the time and really probably wasn't recognized until Vietnam. So. Awesome. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. You're welcome to come up.